The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life Four, Vampires. Chapter One, Deep Cuts. I don't know how many times I've told you never to go into the East Wing. Ski Mask is furious. Never. Do you know what the concept of never is? Never means never. Pulsating veins can be seen throughout his reddened face. His eyes rage with anger as he continues shouting. It doesn't mean occasionally. It doesn't mean under certain circumstances. It means never. He begins pacing as he yells. Are you stupid? Are you? His fury-filled holler echoes throughout the main room. Claire winces with every word. Dempsey and Floppy have taken up refuge behind Claire's legs. Madeline and Max watch on, both whining slightly, as Ski Mask's outburst continues. The rest of the dogs have cowered away in two other rooms. What the hell am I going to do with you now? How can I trust you? He takes an aggressive step toward Claire, who starts backing up. Upon his movement toward Claire, Madeline's whine grows louder and then quickly transforms into a bellowing roar of a bark. Ski Mask stops in his tracks and looks back at Madeline. They lock eyes for a few seconds before Madeline backs down and whimpers loudly, which causes Ski Mask to relax. Now that the tension has decreased, Max feels comfortable letting out several yippy barks as a late backup gesture to Madeline. I'm sorry. Ski Mask turns and looks at Claire. She is shaking with fear as tears stream down her face. Her words are choppy as she speaks. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I was worried. I thought you might be in trouble. I'm so sorry. She bursts out crying, turns, and runs down the south wing corridor to the kitchen, followed by Dempsey and Floppy. Ski Mask lets out a breath and looks back at Madeline, who continues to whine softly. He approaches her and gives her a gentle pat on her big head. It's okay. Good girl. Her heavy tail begins to wag, knowing all is well between them now. He walks down the north wing toward his bedroom. He can see the silhouette of Slick in the doorway. Slick quickly runs deeper into the bedroom, out of sight, as Ski Mask approaches. When he enters the room, Ski Mask sees no dogs. Obviously, they're still frightened. He speaks in a gentle voice, but loud enough for them to hear him, wherever they are. Everything's fine, come on out. Slick, Trip, and Snowman all pop out from under his bed in the loft and race down the stairs. Ski Mask bends down and begins loving on all of them. Madeline and Max join in. It's okay. I'm not mad at any of you. I didn't mean to scare you. They dance around excitedly and begin to playfully wrestle with one another. Even Madeline joins in, but quickly yelps and limps away from the group after Slick puts too much of his weight on her. Careful with her, she's old. Ski Mask walks to Madeline and rubs her back hip. She shows her appreciation by giving him a face lick that nearly gives him whiplash. A rare sense of guilt comes over Ski Mask. He didn't like making Madeline upset or scaring the other dogs. And then there was Claire. He'd seen her cry before but never in the fearful state she was in. Fearful of him. He rises and heads toward the south wing. Upon entering the kitchen, he is greeted by Dempsey and Floppy. He bends down and assures them that all is fine. He looks up at Claire, who is standing on an apple cart in front of the sink with her back to him. Listen, I'm sorry. I went overboard back there. Claire turns and faces him. Her face is beaming. She is clearly relieved, but it's something else that Ski Mask notices. Claire is holding a large knife. Her sleeve is rolled up and her arm is covered in blood. What the hell? Ski Mask hurries toward her. What did you do? Claire is confused at first, but then looks down at where his eyes have traveled and realizes what he is referring to. Oh no! No, it's not what you think. I'm not trying to commit suicide. What happened? I just cut myself. Ski Mask grabs her arm and inspects the large slice across the top of her forearm. He then notices several similar old scars in the same region. Intentionally. What? When I get really, really worked up about something, I cut my arm. It relaxes me. It relaxes you? She shrugs. Some people do yoga. 
I cut my arm. That's weird. She shrugs again. Ski Mask studies her for a moment and seems intrigued. Does it really help? For me, it does. I don't do it often. It's rare that my emotions ever get to the point where I feel the need to. But today was one of those days. Sorry. Claire looks up at him, and Ski Mask begins to lose himself in those bright, gentle eyes of hers, and for the briefest of moments, he gets the urge to wipe the drying tears from her face. His hand even begins to drift upwards before he quickly snaps himself out of it and steps back. He looks away from her, clears his throat, takes a deep breath, and moves on to a new subject. I'm going away for a little while on a job. Not sure how long it'll be. Claire smiles and nods. I'll take care of everything. Ski Mask turns and begins to exit the kitchen, but then stops and looks back at her. I know you will. He exits and heads back to his bedroom where he pulls a large travel bag out of a closet and begins placing a few items in it. The bag is already partially packed. Ski Mask travels often for various jobs and always has a bag mostly packed and ready to go in case something urgent comes up. After adding a few more items, he zips the bag up and takes a seat on his sofa in front of the aquarium. He relaxes, watching the school of graceful elephant nose fish swim peacefully in their safe haven. Ski Mask looks down at Madeline, who has climbed up onto the sofa next to him. She lays her giant head on his lap. He rubs the back of her neck while he thinks back upon his unusual encounter earlier in the night. His encounter with a vampire. Chapter 2 Leanna A pure-line vampire known as Catherine has recently obtained a historic mansion. The location of the mansion is under tight wraps. I need you to acquire the location for me and then run interference while I unknowingly take possession of an item within the mansion. Ski Mask stares at the little girl with bewilderment. You're saying that you're a vampire? Leanna rolls her eyes as Tamale steps forward. I figured her for a screwball too until she- Before Tamale can finish his sentence, he is pinned against the wall by an invisible force, catapulted up to the ceiling, and suspended in midair. Oh, until she proved me otherwise. Ski Mask looks at Leanna, who is staring through him with her black eyes. Impressive for a little girl. Leanna scowls at Ski Mask. You have some nerve. Her black eyes glow as tension fills the room for a few seconds before she relaxes. But that might come in handy. Leanna looks up at Tamale and he is gently lowered back down to his seat. He lets out a nervous breath and adjusts his hat. Thanks. Leanna keeps her eyes fixed on Ski Mask. Are you satisfied? Sure. Are you up for the task? Sounds like a simple job. It's a suicide mission. Normally I would recommend a team of at least six people for such a mission in hopes that one member will live long enough to complete the assignment. Personally, I don't see how you can survive this undertaking alone, but Mr. Jones insists that you are... special. This Catherine, you say she's a pure line vampire? Born of two other vampires. Are you a pure line vampire as well? I am. You look young. A pure line vampire ages one year for every ten human years. So that makes you about 100? She smiles. Almost. Did you and Tamale talk compensation? We did. So while this job ain't exactly a breeze, we're talking a lot of Mazuma. Enough clams to make you pretty damn filthy rich. But like she mentioned, uh, odds are better than not that when it's all said and done, you'll be taking the big sleep. Tamale rises, walks to Ski Mask, and hands him a slip of paper. Ski Mask's eyes widen as he sees the figure scrawled across it. Do we have an agreement? Ski Mask nods. Leanna floats up from her chair and never touches the floor as she glides towards Ski Mask, maintaining eye level with him the entire way. Once she reaches him, she sustains her floating position and shakes his hand. 
What kind of object are you after in this mansion? That's my business. Focus on your business. Schemas shakes his head in frustration. Fine. You're an ornery sort, aren't you? I wouldn't consider myself ornery. That doesn't necessarily mean that's not the case. Tamale chimes in. Uh, you're a bit ornery. Schemas shoots Tamale a disapproving look. Sorry, but it's true. I agree with the vampire. Leanna glares at Tamale and hisses at him harshly. The vampire? Correct me if I misunderstood you, Mr. Jones, but did you just refer to me as the vampire? Tamale stammers nervously. I, 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 uh, I, I have a name. Tamale gulps. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Leanna's scowl transforms into a grin as she giggles. You should have seen your face. She points at Tamale and lets out a playful cackle. It's clear that neither Tamale nor Ski Mask find her joke amusing. She rolls her eyes a bit and shakes her head. So serious. Okay, back to business. She scribbles something down on a small piece of paper, folds it, and hands it to Ski Mask. That's an address. I'm going to set up an appointment for you tomorrow with a man named Mason. He and his albino sidekick make a handsome living from tracking the whereabouts and inner workings of the Pure Line vampire community. They'll have the information you seek. Contact me when your meeting concludes. She floats to the door and turns back to the two men before exiting. Good night, gentlemen. Chapter 3 Mason and the Albino The front door to the black, glassed building is flanked by two Mr. Universe bodybuilder types in tight black t-shirts. A stringy man in a suit stands before them and greets Ski Mask in a professional manner. We've been expecting you. He looks down at the small duffel bag that Ski Mask is carrying and nods to one of the muscle men who does a quick scan of the bag with a metal detecting wand. When the wand doesn't detect anything, the stringy man motions Ski Mask through the door. Right this way. The stringy man guides Ski Mask to an attractive woman in her late fifties wearing a dark dress suit. Belinda, this is the gentleman who has a scheduled meeting with Mr. Mason. Ski Mask follows Belinda up a wide staircase covered with red stair carpet. The staircase winds partially just before ending at the second floor landing. She leads him to a large golden double door which she opens. She motions for Ski Mask to enter the room and then casually shuts the door behind him. The room is dark with the only light emanating from a lamp on a desk about 30 feet in front of him. Behind the desk sits Mason a man in his forties wearing a black fedora with light gray trim. His mustache and sideburns are manicured in a gunslinger style that clashes with his Hawaiian shirt. Have a seat! The albino female standing menacingly behind Mason comes into view. Her straight white hair ends just before her shoulders. Her pants, boots, and fingerless gloves are solid black. The outfit is topped off with a long leather jacket. Her arms are folded and her pale bluish pink eyes stay fixed on Ski Mask as he sits down in one of the two chairs positioned in front of Mason's desk. Ski Mask glares back at the albino. Their eyes lock in a standoff for several seconds. Ski Mask reluctantly breaks his stare from the looming albino and gives his attention to Mason. There's a vampire named Catherine. Pure line vampire. They don't like to be referred to as just vampires. Fine, there's a pure line vampire named Catherine, and you want the location of her new mansion. Ski Mask reaches under his coat, causing the albino to move her hands under her jacket with blinding speed. She stops at that point, but is clearly ready to spring into action if Ski Mask makes any suspicious moves. Ski Mask smirks. Relax, albino. He slows his movement and removes a thick wad of cash tightly encased in clear plastic and tosses it on Mason's desk and then another, and then another. Mason stares at the three large packs of money on the table, grins, and then moves his eyes to Ski Mask. You're working for Leanna, aren't you? Ski Mask doesn't respond. 
The question is rhetorical. Obviously, Mason knows. I'm afraid I can't help you. Ski Mask reaches into the bag, extracts another wrapped batch of cash, and tosses it onto the desk with the others. We've been paid handsomely not to divulge this information to anyone until after tomorrow, midnight. Come back then and we'll talk. I need the info now. Of course you do. Ski Mask takes one more bundle out of the duffel bag and slams it down onto the desk while staring at Mason. This merely amuses Mason. We're getting paid double whatever anyone else offers, so by all means, offer some more. Ski Mask stands and directs his gaze from Mason to the albino, who still stands in the ready position. His urge is to obtain the information with strong arm tactics. He'd love to see what this albino brings to the dance. But Leanna was very clear that if they refused, he should just leave it at that and contact her. He continues to stare back at the albino for several long seconds before he speaks. I do have one question. The albino cocks her head slightly, knowing the question will be directed at her. Does the carpet match the drapes? The albino's pale eyes fill with rage, and she's clearly on the verge of making a move towards Ski Mask when Mason holds up his hand and she quickly regains her composure. Ski Mask snares before he turns and exits. Chapter 4 House of Albinos Per her instructions, Ski Mask meets Leanna at the top of a cliff overlooking a sweeping field. She stands at the edge of the cliff looking down. See those lights? Ski Mask takes a position next to her and notices what appear to be a row of hanging lights from poles. The poles line a walkway which leads to a door carved into the starting slope of a hill. The House of Albinos. It's an abandoned military base that the albinos took possession of years ago and made a home out of it. The lack of pigmentation makes the albino more difficult for us to sense, thus they're well suited for tracking. Albino animals may have a challenging time surviving in the wild, but this brood does just fine. Actually, as long as there are sufficient places to hide, carnivores seem to catch albino and common colored animals at approximately the same rate. Without appropriate hiding places, the albino may be more susceptible to attack, but sometimes predators will give them a pass, probably thinking they're too weird looking to eat. Leanna looks at Ski Mask. She seems impressed. Well, look at that big brain of yours. She looks back at the house of albinos. There are 12 of them. All albino siblings. 11 males and one female. I believe you met her. Leanna reaches out. May I have your hand, please? Ski Mask takes a breath of annoyance and obliges her by holding out his hand. She takes it into hers, closes her eyes, and appears to mentally drift away for a moment. You two didn't quite hit it off, did you? She smiles. As expected. Leanna is about to release his hand and then gets a curious expression over her face. She squeezes his hand tighter and then opens her eyes and looks at him inquisitively while smiling brightly. Who is Claire? Ski Mask jerks his hand away and switches the dialogue back to the main topic. You knew damn well they weren't going to take that money. Why the hell did you bother sending me in there? You like to antagonize people, even when it's not in your best interest. Your charming personality has the albino prime for attack once she notices you on the premises. That will leave Mason alone, and more vulnerable. Leanna fixes her gaze back on the entrance of the House of Albinos as she speaks. I have it on good authority that Mason and his sidekick are in the House of Albinos tonight. He has the location of Catherine's mansion on a tablet that he has on his person. I intend to gain possession of the tablet. You're a vampire. Kill him. Kill his bunny-eyed friend. Take the tablet. What do you need me for? Leanna is quick to correct him. Pure line vampire. I believe I mentioned to you that they make a living from their knowledge of the pure line vampire community. Who do you think their primary customers are? We are. If the albino is by Mason's side, I'll likely have to kill her to get to him, and I would hate to snuff out a worthwhile resource if it's not necessary. 
And that's where I come in. Leanna smiles. I'll do my part. She's formidable. She once killed a pureline vampire. A stupid, bumbling pureline vampire, but still, not an easy accomplishment. What about the other albinos? Her brothers are very protective and would come to her aid if alerted. It would be a serious issue if they were here. Leanna grins. Five are out of the country on legitimate cases. The other six I hired anonymously for a local job. It's a ploy, of course, and they should figure that out in approximately... She looks down at her Gucci wristwatch. Fifteen minutes? Let's move. Leanna and Ski Mask position themselves closer to the entrance. How do we get in? We don't. I do. And I'll be going right through the front door. I'll be tripping a slew of motion detectors along the way, but I'll be well inside the house before they go off. You just hustle down there and make sure you're close enough for the albino to see you. How the hell are you going to get in there before the motion detectors go off? Leanna looks at him with a sly grin. I'm fast. And just like that, she vanishes from in front of him. He can make out a slight blur racing down the pathway, followed by the door to the house of the albinos opening and closing. A few seconds later, sirens blare and multiple floodlights blast on. Ski Mask takes off toward the entrance. He reaches the pathway as the front doors open, and the albino female he met earlier steps out. She is scowling, and her pale eyes are filled with ferocity. Ski Mask's first instinct is to make a smart-ass comment about her genetic condition. The more angry he can make her, the more reckless she will be in the upcoming battle. But before he can do anything, both of her hands dive under her coat and withdraw two knives. She hurls the first one at him. Ski Mask barely raises his right hand up in time to stop the knife from slamming into his head and scrambling his brains. The knife penetrates through the back of his hand with the point of the blade stopping just inches from his eye. The second knife is already on its way. Ski Mask dodges to his left and can feel the air gust and the blade tip nicking his hair as it whizzes by his head. The albino steps forward and kicks over one of the path light poles. She picks it up, shakes the light off the top of it, and begins whirling the metal pole above her head with both hands as she sidesteps closer to Ski Mask. In a flash, she transitions to spinning the pole in front of her, making a pinwheel of blurs before sliding the pole into her right hand and freezing in a demonstrative stance. With her free hand, she motions for him to come forward and challenge her. This elaborate display of skills would be enough to intimidate most opponents, but Ski Mask rarely encounters a formidable opponent and welcomes the competition. He smiles at her while he slowly pulls the knife from out of his right hand. A blast of gunfire from within the house causes the albino to look back over her shoulder, but she realizes she must focus on her adversary who is now brandishing the knife in his left hand and moving toward her. Leanna is through the front door of the house of albinos in the blink of an eye. She takes position against a wall and leans her head in to take a peek into the next room. The room is an armory with a breathtaking variety of guns mounted to the wall. Leanna knows that some of the albinos, including the female, prefer blades and would imagine there is at least one room somewhere within this dwelling with a similar assortment of edged arsenal decorating the walls. Mason and the albino are standing in the center of the armory, but they are not preparing or discussing weaponry as one may expect in such a room. Leanna raises her eyebrows slightly when she sees Mason staring into the albino's blanched eyes. His hand is caressing her cheek. Leanna smiles, having had no idea that this duo had a romantic connection. When the alarms go off, they both turn their heads to a security camera and see Ski Mask running toward the house. The albino whispers to herself, Bastard. She takes off like a bolt toward the front door. Mason tries to stop her. Wait! Mason has a hunch that this is likely some kind of setup, but the albino is out of the room before he can get another word out. He begins moving forward, but stops in his track when he hears the voice. Hello, Mason. The voice comes from behind him. Without hesitation, Mason lunges toward the wall, removes a mini Uzi submachine gun, turns, and begins firing. Ski Mask moves swiftly forward and strikes with the knife, but the albino parries the attempt with the pole. 
He aggressively surges, slashing violently multiple times, but the albino rather easily deflects every blow. She is doing a masterful job at keeping her distance and using the length of the pole to her advantage. He continues his attempts to get inside, but to no avail. She continues to circle him and block every effort he puts forth. His frustration begins to show in his voice. Come on, you milky bitch! He rushes forward with a knife in a stabbing position. The albino counters by spinning the pole and slapping his wrist with the end, which sends the knife flying into the night. She immediately follows up with a hard strike to the side of Ski Mask's face, knocking him sideways and then strikes the other side which sends him reeling. She quickly jabs the end of the pole into his stomach multiple times, doubling him over, and then finishes the barrage with a swift strike to the back of the head that sends him crashing to the ground face first. Not letting up, she swings the pole sideways, hoping to land the finishing blow on his skull, but anticipating the deadly move, Ski Mask rises rapidly and jumps over the pole as it arrives. It is at this very moment when another wave of machine gun fire distracts the albino, causing her head to turn toward the front door. Taking her eyes off of him was just the mistake that Ski Mask needed, and he capitalizes by bull rushing her. She attempts to swing the pole, but he's gotten too far inside of her defenses for the blow to be effective. He wraps his arms around her and with all of his weight on top of her, slams her into the ground. Mason spins as he sprays bullets throughout the room aimlessly. He can't see Leanna, just an occasional blur as she attempts to outmaneuver the onslaught of bullets. He tries his damnedest to be unpredictable as he jerks his body in a range of directions and hopes to catch her off guard. It's his only chance. Leanna is slightly surprised by Mason's aggressive move. She expected to have a brief negotiation with him before he tried anything. This is exactly why he made the move he did. Unforeseen and wise. Dodging the bullets is no problem for Leanna. She whizzes around the room like a beam of light, always making sure she is behind Mason. He's doing an admirable job of pointing the gun around in an unexpected manner. Very smart. A good tactic but not good enough. Leanna makes a motion with her hand, and Mason is suddenly plastered face first against the wall. A few seconds later, against his will, his fingers uncurl from around the gun and it falls harmlessly to the ground. Leanna can see the tablet in the inside pocket of his jacket. She nods and it sails across the room into her hand. Now that she has what she came for, she releases Mason and he crumples to the floor. Thank you. Ski Mask is in a dominant position on top of the albino, but she is swift and able to contour her body enough to muscle into a standing position. But he still has the advantage. He wraps his hand around her throat and drives her back against the body of a gargantuan tree trunk. She grabs onto his forearm with both of her hands and tries to knee him in the groin, but she's losing energy fast, and he's too close to her for the blows to have enough momentum to sway him. Her pale face begins to redden as his hand constricts. Ski Mask can feel her beginning to go limp when he hears a loud crack behind him and a sharp pain in his right shoulder that causes him to wheel around. The albino falls to the ground, coughing, as Ski Mask sees Mason pointing a gun at him. Behind Mason, a black van pulls up and several albino males emerge and run toward him. They are irrelevant though because Mason has him lined up perfectly and at any second he expects the lights to go out. A massive gust of wind hits Ski Mask and suddenly he's looking down at Mason and rising quickly. Mason looks up at him, readjusts his aim and fires, but by this time Ski Mask's distance is too far for Mason's shot to be successful. Ski Mask watches on as the brother albinos converge on their sister. She is now sitting up as they begin to assist her. He can see Mason lower his aim in defeat and turn his attention to his albino companion. Ski Mask continues to watch them all until they become ants underneath him. Within seconds, he is too far away to make out any of them at all. After a few moments, he begins to slowly descend, and he can now see that he is being cradled by Leanna. They reach the ground and he observes that they are standing next to a lake. He can see subtle shimmering of ripples under the moonlight and hear the passive sound of night insects as he slowly begins to get his bearings. What the hell just happened? I saved you. She holds up the tablet and smiles. Nice job. We make a good team. Ski Mask gazes out over the lake. 
In the distance, the loud splash of a fish breaking the surface can be heard. The meeting of the lake's edge rippling against the shoreline relaxes him. It's quite the peaceful scene. Schemask raises his gaze to the star-soaked sky. His drifting thought does not go unnoticed by Leanna. What are you thinking about? At first, Schemask doesn't respond. He continues to soak in the serene surroundings a moment longer before turning to Leanna. What's it like to live forever? I wouldn't know. You know better than I do. If you age one year for every ten human years, you may live to be 800, 900 years old. Possibly. That's forever to me. It's all perspective. Do you know how long a crane fly lives? About two weeks in total, no more than a few days as an adult. Leanna grinned, surprised and impressed with his knowledge of crane flies. Your lifespan is forever to a crane fly. Fair enough, but if you could extend your life, choose to have a second life and a third life, would you? And prolong what's next? Never. Schemask looks at her seriously. What is next? Leanna smiles, displaying her perfect white teeth. Something wonderful. Leanna studies Ski Mask as he looks back over the water and up into the sky. She notices his blood-soaked shirt around his right shoulder and motions to his arm. How is it? He attempts to lift his right arm, but can't. It's dead. Hmm. How about the left arm? He raises it. It's fine. She nods. Good enough. Now comes the hard part. Chapter 5 Suicide Mission The mansion is enormous. It's a breathtaking sight with meticulous features blending Romanesque and Italian influences. A prominent turret highlights the center of the structure, and the porch is lined with imposing columns. The surrounding nightlife is drowned out by the relaxing cascade of a nearby bronze fountain. The grounds are vast and well kept. The wide pathway is decorated with two rows of animal manicured shrubs, giving Ski Mask the feeling that he is being watched as he approaches the entrance. Upon arriving at the mansion, Ski Mask recalls Leanna being impressed by its age. Catherine is 350 years old, she said. Likely the same age as this mansion. Right off the bat, he knew that estimate was incorrect, but who is he to argue with a vampire? With closer inspection of the structure, Ski Mask would make the assessment that Catherine had at least 100 years on this particular structure. Leanna said that there would be no guard station anywhere on the grounds, and so far she is absolutely correct. They're expecting us, but that's not allowed. Whatever that means. He stops, takes his Ski Mask out from his back pocket, and pulls it down over his face before approaching the main entrance. The lock on the door is nothing elaborate and he picks it easily. He opens the door wide, wanting to get a good look at the interior before entering. A gust of wind rushes in from behind and he thinks he notices a blur move past him, but he can't be certain. Ski Mask strolls forward into the house. He isn't sure what to expect, but he's ready for something. He can hear the occasional drop of blood dripping off of his hand onto the floor. He had torn off a piece of his shirt and wrapped it around his knife wound, but by now it's completely blood-soaked and losing its purpose. The foyer is wide and composed of early 20th century decor. The deep red walls give the entrance a warm feel. Medleys of antique decorations are well placed throughout the foyer, giving the place a museum atmosphere. In the distance, his eyes lock onto a tapestry featuring a reproduction of a rather graphic oil painting by Jericho called Head of a Guillotine Man. At least my blood won't clash with the theme. Due to a combination of the hall being sparsely lit and being distracted by the impressive tapestry, Ski Mask doesn't notice the figure of the man at the bottom of the stairwell and is startled by the consecutive pops of three gunshots. 
None of the shots hit its target, and Ski Mask hones in on the thin old man who has to be well into his 80s. As he steps into the light and fires off three more rounds, the final one hitting Ski Mask in his useless arm. The old man begins reloading his gun. Ski Mask realizes that the odds of him surviving another six shots is remote. He grabs a brass candlestick from a nearby table and hurls it at the old man. It hits him in the hand area, slowing him up just enough for Ski Mask to rush him and make impact just before the old man can snap the revolver's cylinder back in place. The old man falls backward. His head thuds against the hardwood floor, momentarily knocking him senseless. Before Ski Mask can turn, another man bursts onto the scene and slams the blade of a six-inch hunting knife into Ski Mask's right upper arm. The man withdraws the knife and quickly swipes at Ski Mask, missing his throat by mere centimeters. Ski Mask steps back to gauge his opponent. An average-sized man, who while no spring chicken, is at least 30 years younger than the old man. His eyes are dark and focused. Sensing that the man is about to lunge, Ski Mask readies himself, and when the man enters his range, Ski Mask kicks him squarely in the balls. He follows this up by kicking the knife out of his hands and then knocking him backwards with a kick to the chest. Ski Mask bends down and picks up the man's knife. His arm hurts like hell from the stab, but he can use it well enough to carve this guy up. Before Ski Mask can step forward, he feels a vice-like grip around his throat. He is thrust backward against the wall and then lifted several feet into the air. He looks down at his assailant. A thin woman with short blonde hair wearing a Japanese house jacket is holding him in the air and penetrating him with her deep blue eyes. The old man rises up with the help of his companion and they watch on as the woman, who remains emotionless, holds Ski Mask with one hand and removes his Ski Mask with the other. She studies his face closely and speaks. You have nice eyes. Ski Mask has to strain to respond. You have nice tits. The younger of the two men lunges forward in anger, but is held back by the old man. How many times do I have to tell you about remaining cool, calm, and collected? Nobody speaks to Catherine like that. And she'll take care of it. The younger man still has to be held back until Catherine addresses them. Leave us. The younger man stops, and the old man ushers him away, leaving Catherine alone with their foe. Although her expression remains emotionless, she can't mask the rage filling her eyes. These two men mean something to her, and she will exact revenge. There is clearly nothing Ski Mask can do about that. Ski Mask stares back at her. The intensity in his eyes can't match hers, but it's not for a lack of trying. She continues to study his face and then closes her eyes and breathes in deep. You're not the complete monster everyone thinks you are. You have a genuine care for your animals. Ski Mask begins to struggle. He is bothered by her insight into his feelings. And you care for someone else. A young lady. Ski Mask kicks fruitlessly and cuts her off before she can go any further. So you're 350 years old, huh? Bet you've sucked a lot of cock in those years. Her grip tightens, successfully eliminating his ability to speak further. Don't worry. I won't tell Claire about your feelings. But unfortunately, neither will you. Ski Mask was hoping she'd stop talking about him and his feelings. He was also hoping for some kind of emotional response from his crass remark. But Catherine doesn't give him the satisfaction, maintaining her stone expression as she plunges her right hand into his stomach and then thrusts upward. Ski Mask tries to grin at her, but the pain has reached such an excruciating level it comes across as a wince. He can feel her hand moving around inside of him, making some kind of soup out of his organs. If her goal is to make this as painful on him as possible, she's succeeding. Fortunately for Ski Mask, the torture only lasts a few seconds before his life expires. Catherine lets Ski Mask go, and his body plummets to the floor. After 350 years of life, not much surprises Catherine, but she is shocked when Ski Mask rises and beats a hasty retreat toward the front door. Ski Mask is inches from the front door when he feels his legs give out and finds himself face first against the floor. He attempts to stand, but an invisible force is pulling him back deeper into the house. Back to Catherine. Shit, it looks like I'm going to lose all of my lives in one night. 
Catherine holds her hand outward as she summons Ski Mask back into her grip. Once again, she holds him by the throat and holds him high into the air. She says nothing, but Ski Mask can tell by her expression that she is confused. Nonetheless, she pulls her hand, which is still dripping with his entrails, into a ready position and is about to impale him again when she hears Leanna's voice. Stop! Catherine holds her death blow, but continues to hold Ski Mask in place as she looks back over her shoulder at Leanna, who stands at the top of a staircase holding up a three-foot golden scepter sparkling with rubies and diamonds. She smiles. It's over. Catherine loosens her grip and drops Ski Mask to the floor. Chapter 6 Monster Bash The sight is nothing short of spectacular. Something most people couldn't even imagine, let alone see. The extensive ballroom is elegantly fashioned with the most elaborate blown glass chandeliers he's ever seen. They line the ceiling, each giving the appearance of a bursting ball of fire frozen in mid-explosion. There are rows of decorative columns on each side of the room. Young women are strapped to each column. They are alive, but extremely groggy as if sedated. As enormous as it is, the room can barely fit the majority of guests who occupy it. Ski Mask assumes the majority of them are pure line vampires, since so many are frequenting the tied up girls and drinking directly from their bodies. As he gazes across the extensive ballroom, he notices that vampires come in a variety of shapes and sizes. The assortment of attire is something that piques Ski Mask's interest. With one quick glance across the room, he can identify a sari, a hanfu, multiple kaminos, a seraphan, lederhosen, several kilts, what he's pretty sure is a Scandinavian gaki, a few dashikis, and even one vampire wearing a traha de lucis, which most would only expect to see on a matador. Ski Mask's gaze stops when he sees the younger of the two men he fought earlier. He has cleaned up since the skirmish. His hair is slicked back, and he is wearing a nice black button-up shirt, but is still seething. He stares daggers at Ski Mask from across the room. Ski Mask locks eyes with him for a few moments until he is distracted by a voice next to him. Ten years ago, I would have hit the bullseye with all six of those shots. I'm getting old. The old man is dressed for the occasion as well, wearing a suit and jacket. He holds out his hand. I'm Lee. Ski Mask nods and shakes his hand. Lee motions toward his companion. You'll have to forgive my apprentice, Jack. He can hold a grudge. Insults hurled at Catherine aren't taken lightly by either of us, but he sure has a knack for holding on to negative emotions longer than one should. He's in his fifties, but he's still learning. He's a fantastic apprentice. I really couldn't ask for anyone better. It's nice to have someone you can count on. That statement makes Ski Mask stop and think of Claire. His thoughts linger on her longer than he thinks they should, so he changes the subject. So what the hell happened tonight? Leanna didn't explain? Ski Mask shakes his head. Oh, that's right. It would be against the rules. Rules? You took part in a ritual tonight. It's Leanna's 100th birthday. When a pure line vampire reaches triple digits, they are presented with a quest to find the 100 year scepter. They are only given the name of an elder pure line vampire who will possess the scepter. Catherine was drawn as the possessor for Leanna. Leanna had a small window to determine the location of the scepter and then 24 hours of her triple digit birthday to obtain it. Catherine was guarding the scepter. Caretakers are allowed to assist, so we were monitoring the rest of the mansion. Once you put us in harm's way, Catherine intervened, leaving the scepter unattended long enough for Leanna to retrieve it. He drops his head in shame. We failed Catherine tonight. We proved to be her weakness, and Leanna exploited that. It was clever. You came through for Leanna. I hope she paid you well. 
Ski Mask acknowledges his lofty payment with a nod and goes back to gazing about the room. Quite the scene, isn't it? I can honestly say I've never seen anything like it. These don't happen often. I'm 86 years old and I've never seen one of these before tonight. Well, you're obviously not one of these vampires. Lee corrects him. Pure line vampires. No, I'm not. I'm Catherine's caretaker. Jack there is my apprentice. What do you do? We assist Catherine in her day-to-day -day life. I imagine she can take care of herself just fine. Lee chuckles. <laughs> You'd be surprised. The life of a pure line vampire is complex, and while she is powerful, she can't be everywhere at once. It's nice to have assistance to help. Ski Mask's mind drifts to Claire and how much she does for him. Sometimes he begins to wonder what life would be like without her, but he always pushes that thought from his mind before it can properly manifest. It's not a thought he wants to have. Yes, it is. Lee nods and is about to walk away when Ski Mask asks him a question. How long have you been doing this? Since I was 13 years old. 13? Have you ever regretted making that decision? Lee doesn't hesitate when he answers. Never. Not for one second of my life. I love Catherine. I've always loved her. To spend your entire life with someone you love. Isn't that what it's all about? Lee gives Ski Mask a pat on the back and walks deeper into the room. Ski Mask watches him as he mingles with a few others, but his mind stays on Lee's question. Is that what it's all about? His thought is interrupted by the squeal of a microphone. Someone on a stage at the back of the room begins to speak. Thank you, one and all, for attending the 100-year birthday bash for our guest of honor, Liana. The speaker holds for the long round of applause to diminish. Not only has she reached triple digits, but she is one of only seven Pureline vampires in the last thousand years to successfully retrieve the 100-year scepter. The crowd erupts and looks up as Liana floats effortlessly above them and quietly places herself at the center of the stage and speaks into the microphone. Thank you, Purelines. I'm honored to have you all here tonight to help me usher in my triple digits. It was a privilege to participate in the Scepter Quest, and I could not have achieved victory without my partner in crime who survived the night. I affectionately refer to him as Ski Mask. He's in the back of the room. Give him a hand. He's shy. The room erupts in ovation as the Pure Line vampires turn to look at Ski Mask. Lee moves close to Ski Mask and points at him so that all in the room know exactly who Ski Mask is. Ski Mask stands stationary, astonished by the reception. He looks around at the cheering crowd. Several of the Pure Line vampires near the stage float upward to get a better view of him. Everyone appears to be commending Ski Mask, with the exception of Jack, who continues to stare at him with pure hatred. Ski Mask begins to feel uncomfortable with the attention. He gives a quick courtesy wave to the mass in hopes that will bring the applause to an end. As hoped, it quickly diminishes to a smattering and the attendees go back to their mingling. Ski Mask turns when he hears the voice behind him. Why aren't you dead? Catherine's gaze is cold and he can still see a touch of ire in her eyes. There is nothing pleasant about the energy she is putting forth. Before he can respond, Leanna appears next to him. He doesn't divulge his secrets. For example, he's not anxious to tell me about Claire. This perks Catherine's curiosity. You sensed her too. Leanna nods while Ski Mask shakes his head. You know what? You pure line vampires are meddlesome. I think I'm ready to go. Thank you, Ski Mask. Leanna floats up to meet him at eye level and gives him a tender kiss on the cheek. I'm proud of you. Ski Mask nods and chuckles to himself at the motherly feeling he just received from a girl with the appearance of a ten-year-old. As the Pure Line vampires watch him walk out of the ballroom into the night, Catherine speaks. You may want to consider him for a caretaker. Leanna shakes her head. His heart lies elsewhere.
Chapter 7 Home Again The sun has risen by the time Ski Mask approaches the entrance to his home. The Pureline vampires were insistent that he had feelings for Claire, but he never thought about her in that way. She's an employee, someone who works for him and takes care of things for him. She's nothing more than that. He kept telling himself that over and over, even though he couldn't help but wonder how she was doing while he was away, and that he was looking forward to seeing her more than usual. Ski Mask enters his home and is surprised to find himself smiling as he sees Claire rise from the couch and approach him. But she's not smiling. She's not happy. She seems sullen. Something is wrong. Ski Mask's smile disappears as he grows concerned. What's wrong? Claire clears her throat and lets out a deep breath. Tears are welling up in her eyes and her voice is choppy when she speaks. It's Madeline. The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 5, Medusa.